Some bottles cost 50 cents and others $5,000. You can pick up glass decanters for a few dollars or a thousand dollars. But if you love glass, this week's historical bottle club convention has something for you. People from all over the nation and the world have gathered in Montgomery this weekend, capping off the week Governor Wallace has proclaimed as Glass with Class Week. They'll also be able to see bottles that it would take probably a trip to a hundred museums or more in order to see the bottles and the quality of bottles that we have here. 800 exhibitors, 400 sales booths, and 40 selected displays of superior quality glass take up the Civic Center floor. Anything made of glass can be found, antique bottles, jars, insulators, and decanters. For some collectors, this is only a hobby, but for others, it's a full-time business. Things that I am most interested in as a dealer and as a consultant to an auction company are the finest things, the things that are uh, probably the most expensive. Uh, they're not the things that you're going to come in and, uh, and find uh, inexpensively here. There's, there are no real steals. These dealers know what they have. What is so special about this type of glass? Well, you don't every day see them. They survive, what, 300 years? Uh, I think it's um, very special. The National Federation of Historical Bottle Clubs elected to hold their annual show in Alabama for the first time this year. And the state chapter has many collectors and enthusiasts. The glass brings the people here, and it is special. But the people themselves make the convention a success. The people are what this hobby is all about. It's not the glass. The glass is kind of the thing that helps us along to meet others. Um, the people are the finest things, and if you can collect those uh, in your lifetime, you've really done the right thing. The Glass with Class convention continues tomorrow at the Civic Center from 10 o'clock until 4 p.m. Dean Argo, WSFA TV News. There's so much offered in dance that it's not just being able to perform and being in a company. There's just the experience, the training, the discipline, the, the, the dedication. It's, there's more than just what you see on stage. And Chris Schink should know. She spent years on stage and is currently the director of the Roseanne Zimmerman Ballet Center in Los Angeles. But this week she's in Montgomery teaching a two-week seminar to 50 dancing students in the Montgomery School of Fine Arts. Chris is bringing a little bit of L.A. to Montgomery by teaching West Coast variations and techniques to the Alabama dancers. Just the opportunity to learn from someone who knows the choreography is a good experience for us. And then again, we have a chance to perform them at the end of the seminar. So that's one big advantage. At the end of the seminar, the Montgomery dancers will perform dances choreographed by Chris on August 25th at Huntington College. Lisa Walsh, WSFA TV News.
Great. We start with Lanny Watkins in the par 5 11th hole. He had reached the green in two, and with this putt from 60 feet away, Watkins sends it in for Eagle. He stands at 11 under par in second place after a 68. Lee Trevino was hot with the putter as well on the 11th hole. This for birdie, and he uses all of the cup. Trevino went to 14 under par. Another veteran, Gary Player, continues to stay in the hunt. On the 18th, putting across the fringe, lots of speed, but the ball hit dead center and popped in. Player with the 69 stands at 10 under par. Trevino had a three-stroke lead heading into the 18th hole, but this second shot out of the trap goes off the mark. Trevino's ball ended up in the water by the 18th green. He ended up with a double bogey on the hole, but a 67 for the day gives Trevino a one-stroke lead at 12 under par heading into tomorrow's final round. This is Scott Clark reporting for NBC News. When the Republican National Convention kicks off tomorrow in Dallas, there won't be a whole lot of surprises. The party's candidate is already chosen, and the party's platform committee authored a document which President Reagan can feel at home with. Montgomery Mayor Emery Falmer's wife, Anita, was a member of that committee in Dallas. Mayor Falmer says his wife and the other 109 members have given the president a challenge. I found that it was the, the, the people wanted to express their appreciation to President Ronald Reagan for the job that he's done and to give him a comfortable platform on which to run uh, and a challenge for the next four years. The Republican platform calls for U.S. superiority on defense, no tax increase, no mention of an equal rights amendment, strong opposition to abortion, interest in a national sales tax, and returning the country to the gold standard. Mayor Falmer says the convention, although containing no surprises, will not be boring either. The party has a strong candidate, one the country can identify with. We've got a good president, a good vice president. We've got a good thing going. America's back. Uh, president Reagan has led us back to a confidence in ourselves, and that uh, uh, let's keep going. As for the Democrats' choice for a vice president, Falmer is not impressed. There are many women who could uh, uh, hold that slot. I'm not saying that a woman shouldn't, but I'm saying that she's not as qualified as many other people uh, are. Last-minute finishing touches are being made in Dallas as the convention delegates arrive and make ready for a week of politics. Mayor Falmer says the president will carry Alabama during the election. None of the state's delegates are black and only 12 are women. But party officials are quick to point out that most of the voters in the state are registered Democrats and that the racial and minority makeup has nothing to do with Alabama's Republican well, support. Uh, Come like November, they say, uh, Reagan will serve another four years in the White House. I'm doing all, all I know how to do for President Reagan, I will continue to do that. I think he will carry Alabama, and I am certain he'll be re-elected president uh, on November the 6th. Dean Argo, WSFA TV News. Wind was blowing so fast that it just blew a sheet of water 
sideways. You couldn't even see out across the driveway. Hail started coming and it preceded a big wind. We heard a big wind and a loud noise, looked out the window, and that shed was in our backyard and the fence had been blown up against that other fence and all the furniture blown around. So I think some kind of small tornado must have come through. Well, it was moving in a southeast direction and it hit the neighbors behind us, destroyed their metal storage shed, yeah, blew their that? fence into our yard and uprooted yeah, one tree of mine, but uh, it skipped back up and there and went on. The hail did as much damage as anything. It was, it was very severe hail. Lee Trevino was trailed today by Lanny Watkins. The two entered today's final round with only one stroke between them. After some early problems, Watkins birdied on number six and was in a tie at 13 under with Trevino. A one-hour rain delay forced the likes of Trevino, Watkins, and playing partner Gary Player into a nearby house at Shoal Creek. When play resumed, Spaniard Seve Ballesteros was making a charge with a jewel of a chip shot on number nine. Calvin Pete was also in the hunt. He moved to 10 under with a birdie putt on the backside. But the last round from Shoal Creek was between three men. Trevino and Watkins were tied at 13 under when Player made a 60-foot putt on number 12. The South African turned his back knowing it was in. Trevino and Watkins swapped positions on number nine as they headed for the final nine holes. Shoal Creek's creator, Jack Nicholas, bought a round of applause, his last shot for a birdie. He would finish at one under for the tournament Lenny Watkins ran into trouble on the par 5 11th hole. He was now tied with Trevino for the lead. And it was here where Trevino took control. A birdie shot on the 14th gave him a score of 14 under. They would stay that way. Trevino on the 18th hits the fairway for the first time this week. While Player and Watkins were attempting to catch Trevino, he would capture his first win since 1981 and his second PGA victory. His putt for birdie on 18 rolled around and made it in. That placed him at 15 under. Lee Trevino, the winner of the 66th PGA Championship. Baltimore trailed 1-0 in the bottom of the third when Rick Dempsey, with a man on, sends Bruce Keeson's pitch for a ride to left. A two-run homer made it 2-1 two to one Orioles. Later in the third inning, it's Eddie Murray reaching Keeson for a single to right field. Mike Young was on second base, and as the throw comes in, Young will score. The Orioles led 5-1 after three. In the sixth inning, Dempsey steps to the plate again. This time he faces reliever Kurt Kaufman, but he gets the same result. A shot to left for his second homer of the day Baltimore in command six to two later in the sixth inning Eddie Murray slashes one to left field Brian Downing comes charging hard and goes sliding for the ball Downing with a nice catch to end the inning but the Baltimore bats were working on this day in the seventh inning Gary Renicky sends another one to left field this good for a three-run homer the Orioles go on to beat California ten to four this is Scott Clark reporting for NBC News The world champion Raiders wasted little time in testing Miami's secondary on their first possession. Jim Plunkett went downfield to Malcolm Barnwell. Barnwell made the grab at about the 20. That set up a 31-yard field goal by Chris Barr. Three minutes before halftime, Don Strzok throwing his second intercept of the game. Howie Long caught it and scored. Raiders led 20-6 at halftime. In the third quarter, Miami rookie running back Joe Carter out of Alabama scored on a three-yard run. 2013 Raiders. In the fourth quarter, third-string quarterback Jim Jensen on a three-yard run. Miami led 26-23. It was 29-23. The Raiders had one last chance, but the pass was broken up. Miami 29, the Raiders 23. Andy Lascano for NBC News.
No one connected with the case will say how much money is involved. The attorneys agreed to keep it confidential. 19-year-old Charles Anthony Roussant and his brother, 33-year-old Hamp Roussant, were shot after Hamp Roussant was stopped for a traffic violation. The police said Hamp Roussant fired first. A grand jury investigated and said the same thing. But attorneys for the family said the shootings weren't warranted and the Roussants would be alive if a rookie police officer had known how to make a traffic arrest. The case ended quietly enough, but it didn't start that way. Last summer, there were marches, protests, and a boycott of Eufaula stores. Agitators. City officials complained about what they called outside agitators. Today, the Eufaula police chief said the Rousseau case had not changed his police department or its policies. But apparently, the case made a difference in the Eufaula city elections this summer. Mayor George Little was defeated, and he says this case had a lot to do with it. In October, a new mayor and three new councilmen take office. Susan Silvernail, WSFA TV News. School board members were hoping to hear tonight some encouraging news about opening Dothan schools next week. What they heard instead was a possibility classes may not begin until September. The magnitude of what we're talking about of getting the schools clean and getting these three schools where we can get in there to clean is approaching the point, we may be at the point where it will be humanly impossible to do it in time to start school next week. This school, Stringer Street Elementary, is the only school where asbestos is still being removed. But Watson says at least two other schools are still not safe. At the present time, there are three schools that uh, you can't walk inside the schools without having a mask on with air holes on it. And that's the problem. School officials blame the delay on not enough people working on the project. The local architect supervising the project says without more people, the work won't be finished this week. The way I sit today, and my observations today, they can't meet the deadline that they gave us last Thursday, the 17th, when they said they'd be through in 10 days. The school board will meet again tomorrow afternoon. By then, they hope to have permission to hire local firms for the cleanup. One thing's for certain, board members are not happy over the situation. We need to go ahead and get these schools clean so the so <coughs> kids can get back in there. Cal Calloway, WSFA-TV News, Dothan. More than 150 members of the Hainville Parents Teachers Association and the Lowndes County Community Organization have informed the school system they will boycott if the state's plan to consolidate the county's four high schools is implemented on Wednesday. But the boycott is only part of the concerned parents' master plan. An injunction has been filed with Circuit Court Judge Arthur Gamble to prevent the consolidation. Judge Gamble has not signed the order yet. And they've contacted the U.S. Justice Department because, according to parents, an existing court order mandates the Justice Department must pre-clear any plan to change the racial makeup of the county's schools. Federal officials in Atlanta are checking on that order. The parents say Hainville needs a high school, and if forced to move to another school, their children's safety cannot be guaranteed. The consolidation effort has been laid out 
It's haphazard. It's going to have children going all over the place. We're going to have youngsters who are standing along, alongside dangerous highways unaccompanied. And uh, they're shifting them all over with no rhyme or reason. Under the state's plan, Hainville and Lowndes County High would be converted into middle schools and the students bust to Central and Calhoun High Schools. The parents say they need help, but they say they can't go to their state senator. Our state senator, Mr. Hank Sanders, represents the Lowndes County School Board. The county superintendent of education, Eura Lee Haynes, would not grant an on-camera interview. She did say, however, that she appreciated the parents' point of view, but she says the consolidation of Lowndes County High Schools will give the students a more precise education. The parents' battle with the school board is only one part of the problem facing Lowndes County educators. The State Board of Education recently released a 127-page report harshly criticizing the local board and its schools. With schools opening Wednesday, the parents will hold a strategy meeting Tuesday night at Hainville High, and if the Justice Department or the circuit courts do not intervene, Loma says they will have no other choice but to keep their children home. Dean Argo, WSFA, TV News, Lowndes County. He's a country music superstar, a man who has turned his ability to whisper into a successful career. His name is Whispering Bill Anderson. When that old sun goes down across Dixieland. But lately, the stage, radio, and TV star has been trying his hand at a new business, promoting a nationwide restaurant chain called Po Folks. One of the first successful records I had was called Po Folks, and a little later on when I formed my own band, I called them, after the song Po Folks, I called them the Po Boys for several years, and then added some girls to the group and changed the name to the Po Folks. Anderson likes his new job, traveling all over the country, shaking hands and signing autographs. Today, he even helped deliver a load of free dinners to the Faith Rescue Mission. All of it gives him a chance to come in close contact with his many fans. It's not like being on a stage and an audience out there. It's it's one-on-one, -on -one, and that's something that you don't always get in the music business, and it's something I enjoy. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. injection of waste using class one wells. My concern was being that an, I believe that an absolute ban is not necessary. If at any time during the operation a leak did develop in the casing, in the tubing, packer, this would be detected on your surface. This is a cross-section of a typical waste injection well. If permitted again in Alabama, these wells would have to be drilled thousands of feet below groundwater supplies and through a layer of shale and clay that would prevent the wastes from contaminating the groundwater above. Geology plays a big part in where an injection well can be located. Jim War of the Department of Environmental Management says not all areas of Alabama are ideal. Generally, uh, North Alabama is, is not suitable. Uh, neither is central Alabama. Uh, the primary area that it appears uh, where the most likely uh, geologic formations would exist is in the extreme south Alabama. Mostly around Mobile? Mobile, Baldwin, maybe Escambia counties in that area. Nearby states like Louisiana permit disposal wells to accept wastes from just about anywhere. The proposal for Alabama would limit the wastes going into the ground to only that generated on a particular site. A proposal for deep well waste injection is on the agenda of tomorrow's State Environmental Management Commission meeting. And Attorney General Charles Graddock has put the commission on notice that he'll fight deep well injection if it's allowed in Alabama once again. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News. We've gone back and we have done all that we can do in terms of providing the meaningful experiences initiate a competency-based kind of curriculum whereby we're going to have periodic evaluations step by step. There's no need of going to calculus when you can't do arithmetic, and it may take you long to get to calculus, and it takes me. Uh, let's tear down the barriers that you've got to graduate four years from now. You graduate when you can. 
uh, when you want to. So we are making the needed changes at the gr on the ground floor that's going to impact on the performance of all of our students, whether it's on a, a certification test, a job performance in the Air Force. Lee Trevino wondered if he'd ever win again. The Merrimacks hadn't claimed a tour event since 1981. Ironically, his last major triumph was the PGA exactly a decade ago. Trevino began the final round one up on Lanny Watkins and two ahead of ageless Gary Player. After 15 holes, Watkins still trailed by one. But with Trevino in trouble on the 16th, Watkins placed his tee shot to the par three hole within 12 feet. A birdie by Watkins and a bogey by Trevino, and Lanny would have the lead. Instead, Trevino made his par-saving putt and obviously rattled Watkins, missed his birdie, and proceeded to bogey the final two holes. Trevino finished with a flurry, as a champion often does, birdieing 18 for a record score of 15 under par. He can be claimed by any of the other 27 National Football League teams. If he is claimed, he may report to the claiming club or as a vested veteran, he can become a free agent and negotiate with any team. Come on, everybody, stand up. This is a broke all the records. Ricky Klein. Klein's final day catch of 27 pounds, 5 ounces, brought his three-day total to 75 pounds, 9 ounces, an all-time individual classic record. Dr. Greg South of Richmond, Virginia, staged a last-day charge to catch the leader, but his second-place finish with 50 pounds, 1 ounce, couldn't overtake the calculating Klein, who led from the first day. The day belonged to Clyde, but he was joined on the platform by a man who is a lot better known. 
Vice President George Bush, who stopped by the Classic en route to the Republican National Convention in Dallas. I feel like I'm standing in the Olympic Games of bass fishing, so thanks for letting me come. Thank you very much. It was a classic of records, broken ones. The first ever three-time winner of a Bassmasters Classic, Rick Klon. The highest ever individual three-day catch, Rick Klon. It was a story of tremendous effort, of skill and endurance. From Pine Bluff, Arkansas, this is Dan Black on the Bassmaster Tournament Trail. The announcement of the start of equal access service is no surprise. It was ordered by the federal government to try to increase competition among long-distance telephone companies. Basically, equal access allows phone customers to choose any one of seven long-distance companies and then be able to reach that company by simply dialing one plus or zero plus. Currently, only customers of AT&T can do that. Everyone else must dial long access codes to get long distance. Equal access will at first be offered to only a limited number of Bell customers, those whose phone numbers start with 26 or 83 or 293 or 241. Everyone else will have to wait for now. And equal access will only be used for long-distance calls that go outside the Montgomery Phone District, which stretches from Demopolis to Eufaula. Calls within that area will all be handled by AT&T. For now, there are seven companies within the Equal Access program. No one knows if that number will change. Uh, down the road, there may be more, uh, maybe less. Uh, we, we just don't know. It will take about two years for all of South Central Bell's customers to be offered the Equal Access service. In the meantime, Bell is advising its customers to read all the brochures it's getting from Bell and from other companies to try to eliminate as much confusion about Equal Access as possible. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. I can always give you some. People bring me champagne, wine, and all that. Now I don't drink it. It will be basically used as program support type funds. Uh, I've assured the city council it won't be used for salaries. It will be used to help with our neighborhood service centers program and our direct assistance to families uh, who are below the poverty guideline. Uh,
This is one of the few teacher groups Dr. Teague will meet with before the new school year begins. His message to the teachers was simple, commit to excellence. Dr. Teague says that commitment is necessary because the public is now demanding more from education. It tickles the heck out of me. I'm glad the public's looking at us. I think you are too. So we must make sure that we continue to regain the confidence that's been lost two decades ago. These teachers will be putting Dr. Teague's plan for excellence into effect this year. He says a plan will make a difference in the classroom if it's carried out. What we must make sure of is that 1983 and 84 do not become remembered as the years of a lot of educational rhetoric. It's time now to put that rhetoric into action. Dr. Teague says other things can be done to improve Alabama's public schools, such as adding five work days for teachers. He says these improvements will be easier to get with increased public support, which the superintendent points to in a recent Gallup poll. This is the first time in about three decades that the public confidence has gone up sharply. The public is back with us, expecting good things to happen. Cal Calloway, WSFA-TV News, New Brockton. The Hainville Parents Teachers Association says they do not want to keep children out of school tomorrow, but parents say they have no other choice. A unanimous vote was taken tonight to boycott the Lowndes County school system rather than allow their children to be bused to other schools in the area. We got high school in Fort Deposit. Those children are going to have to be bused up to Calhoun. Then we have the high schoolers here at Hainville High are going to have to be bused over there to Calhoun, and in some instances, some over to Central. <laughs> Under a state plan, the county's four high schools will be consolidated into two as school begins. One Moss's community resident says the consolidation will send her six children to four different schools. That my blind child going off to a school in Montgomery County. Everybody in the whole county know about where she going but me. But State Board of Education officials say the plan is necessary to hopefully end some of the county school system's problems. Any attempt to prevent it, uh, if they do boycott, they will get with the board and see what to do about it. But we don't anticipate a major problem. The parents here say their request to stop the consolidation has fallen on deaf ears at the school board. And by keeping their children home tomorrow, they hope to force the school board into making a decision. And if the school board chooses not to stop the consolidation, the parents say they will make a change in the upcoming elections. In Hainville, Dean Argo, WSFA TV News. So frequently these uh, parents are immature. Disastrous cases in our society, alcohol and drug related. And we're now going to have the ability to carry this message of Maybe daddy wouldn't have gotten drunk. Or if I'd have been a good little girl, mother wouldn't be so mad at me. These kinds of things. And mainly in the urban and ghetto areas of the large your judgment, you do silly things things you wouldn't normally do, you take chances. And the major reason is, and this is important, that we're gonna miss. Somewhere between 60, and a new study they did in Georgia showed 80% alcohol involved. Now, somebody wanna guess. It was several years ago when a court ruling allowed loungers and retail outlets to sell liquor by the bottle. Within months, hundreds of people applied for lounge licenses to open packaged stores. Some 350 of them now operate across the state. Most are in small buildings or coupled with small grocery outlets or gas stations. But the ABC board says mixed in there are some fly-by-night operations who use the license to get a 10% liquor discount, only keep a dozen or so bottles on hand, sell to minors, and according to ABC authorities, generally damage the package store reputation. Selma package store owner Howard Strickland thinks the board is on the right track. And Governor Wallace is going to end it. He has said he was going to end the fly by nights, the uh, two-bit operations I hear that sell everything but booze but use the uh, liquor license as a front. I'm, I'm in total favor of that. 
But while most of his colleagues agree their industry needs protection, they're upset because very few of them can meet the minimum requirements of 750 square feet of space, more than 200 feet between the store and any gas pump, a minimum of 50 brands on hand, and other guidelines that weren't expected of them when they went into business. It's been changed in midstream, just like one of the guys from uh, Asheville, Alabama, said that they came along with a torpedo, just boom, just blowing away. And, and we've talked about thousands and thousands of dollars invested in these businesses, and now they've changed the, the rules of the game in midstream. And it'll put many of them out of business? Sure, certainly will. Board members didn't give any indication how long it would be before they decide whether to soften the regulations or hold fast to them. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News. My opponents, two opponents in the Democratic primary, but basically I think in all honesty and candor, we have to admit that they are basically unknown. They will support. Well, truly, I guess God only knows, but I do hope that we reachieve re enough of our common sense and our traditional values to get our institution, the family, a little bit uh, more together for the happiness of all concerned. I hope that we get our security perspective just a little bit more squared away and more bipartisan than it presently is. I think we're a little in trouble there, and I don't like to have impassioned partisan arguments about things we can't afford to be partisan about. The original question seemed simple enough. Would the state allow the licensing of injection wells for on-site disposal of hazardous waste? but the staff didn't think the proposal was too prudent. The proposal was that there be on-site wells permitted, but not commercial wells. And the department's position on that, due to legal consultation from my attorneys and from the attorney general's office, that this would be discriminatory and would be unconstitutional. This question of constitutionality and uncertainty of what the commission might end up voting on led to many confusing moments. Then we'll get to the we get to the exact wording. If the consensus of if a consensus is that against class one injection well, period. Period. Okay, that's see? just the other side of the same question All right. I just asked. And so the the, the motion has to be. And then there's if there's no sense in wasting any time. There's no sense in talking. The, sense of the, the commission then held an informal vote on the general question of allowing deep well injection. The idea was rejected four to three. But before the commission members could deal the issue a final death blow, the members recessed, only to return and table the whole issue for another month. The commission wants the proposal for deep well injection refined. This may require additional public hearings, and these hearings may delay the whole issue for many more months. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News. I bought a high-priced automobile, which uh, to me, all of them high-priced, but that was a high-priced one. Uh, the reason I became state legislator, uh, to tell them a few things you don't, you ought to travel enough to eat around the state. Okay. Uh, so we're concerned about the uh, 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 have they here. Uh, we're going to have to go to the administrator, but if you are just a parent, the PTAs, the PTOs, whatever group you call ever decide to be a voice that all other special interest groups will be dwarfed. They're your children, and it's your money. And uh, the ADC um, drafted a bill that was uh, sponsored by Senator John Teague and Representative Fred Horn of Birmingham that now makes it possible or requires boards of registrars in every county to appoint at least one deputy registrar in every precinct. Those deputy registrars uh, will have the power now to register people any time, any place. Uh, their term of appointment will also coincide with that of boards of registrars, so they can't be dismissed uh, willy-nilly. So as a result of that legislation, it will open up the, uh, the gates for black and white citizens to become registered uh, deputy registrars throughout the state. So virtually all of the legal barriers to uh, voter registration 
will be eliminated as a result of this bill. It has not been pre-cleared yet by the Justice Department, but we feel confident that it will. The Census Bureau report shows a national decrease in blacks going to the polls, but it shows an increase in the southern states, particularly Alabama. Jerome Gray, an official of the Alabama Democratic Conference, says a new piece of legislation could mean even more black votes. Uh, the ADC um, drafted a bill that was uh, sponsored by Senator John Teague and Representative Fred Horn of Birmingham that now makes it possible or requires boards of registrars in every county to appoint at least one deputy registrar in every precinct. Those deputy registrars uh, will have the power now to register people anytime, any place. Uh, their term of appointment will also coincide with that of boards of registrars so they can't be dismissed uh, willy-nilly. ADC figures show 375,000 black registered voters in Alabama. That same organization's statistics show 300,000 black eligible voters. Officials of the Alabama Democratic Conference say they hope that the deputy registrars will make the job of registering the remaining 300,000 blacks easier than it has been in the past. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA-TV News reporting. We presented the budget. We uh, mentioned the fact that it would be, budgets would be a little Monday, uh, September the 3rd. So those... Any further questions? Mr. Clerk, first item was the debt service budget for 1985. Yes, ma'am. Due to recent cutbacks of block grants, the agency cannot continue to serve the normal people that we served in the past years. I'd like to emphasize the fact that we do our work. In order to do what we're proposing to do, describing here, it will mean that the board uh, of education will have to delay the opening of school until September 4th. Those are the words the superintendent feared he would have to say, that school could not open this month. After looking at the progress of the asbestos removal at Stringer Street Elementary today and realizing other schools still must be cleaned up from the removal, school officials agreed on a new opening date after Labor Day. There's no way we can open school next week. In my estimation, we must delay school opening until September 4th. That's a delay of six school days. Tonight, the school board adopted a new calendar, which will make up those days with school ending on May 31st. What this calendar would do would add one day to the uh, school year at the end of the year. The other days would be picked up. The project the subcontractor, Environmental Protection nice. Services of Huntsville, has oh. agreed to let a Dothan firm take over some of the cleanup. Board members warn, however, if the project is delayed anymore, it will call in the bond for the project. We feel very strongly that we've uh, been somewhat abused and we'd like to you know, be able to go forward this time and uh, you know, get these schools open. Cal Calloway, WSFA TV News, Dothan. Richard, Auburn coach Fresh Pat Dye told members of the state media that if the Tigers were playing Miami today, Mike Mann would be the starting quarterback. The senior from Sylacauga apparently won the job during the Tigers' third game-type scrimmage of the fall. But Mann wasn't so sure the four-way battle was over when we talked to him after Coach Dye's news conference. I think that's very exciting you know, for Coach Dye to say something like that. I, I think it's still kind of indecisive because you know, Pat Washington practiced yesterday and he, he looked really good, I thought, you know, running and throwing the ball. So it's... You know, whether I'm a starter or whether I'm in the supporting role, it doesn't matter to me, just as long as I can help the team, you know, one way or another. While Mann and many other members of the team have been mulling over the Miami game for weeks, Heisman candidate Bo Jackson says he won't start thinking about the Hurricanes until just before game time. Jackson drew praise from Miami coach Jimmy Johnson via a special phone hookup from Miami. You've got the, the size and the strength to, to be one of the, you know, the top backs, uh, you know, for a long time to come. Uh, I think... Just looking at film, uh, you know, Auburn's football team is a very physical group. Uh, they're big and strong, and they can overpower you, and, and, of course, that's a major concern for us. Several Auburn freshmen will see playing time against the Hurricanes, including one from Montgomery. More about that at 10.
teachings in his head to have a, have a play there. I mean, it just, you can go out there and work on drills a matter of time. And I'm well pleased with playing that have a, have a play there. you what's been the most difficult adjustment well um intensity it had to be um, um plus running <laughs> i never really had to run from one end of the field to the other non-stop pick that thing up man pick it up Coming in here. As you see, the schools are ready. Uh, 8.30 this morning, all the boys and girls here are in classes, and uh, I, I think that uh, the teamwork that we've experienced here in Lyons County has been outstanding. Last winter, district attorney's investigators seized academic records of 50 graduates of ASU who are now certified to teach in Alabama schools. That investigation may have turned up a number of questionable certifications to the State Department of Education. It all began when an informant told the district attorney some teachers may not be qualified to work in Alabama classrooms. District Attorney Jim Evans. Uh, last year, we received a complaint uh, from an individual. The complaint alleged that uh, uh, the certification of transcripts uh, from Alabama State University uh, were made to the uh, Teacher Certification Board uh, and the Board of Education, and that those transcripts had been altered to reflect uh, courses and grades which were either not taken or not completed successfully, and that uh, grades were changed from either uh, a failing grade to a passing grade, and per or perhaps from a passing grade to a higher grade. Uh, our office has uh, been looking into the matter. It's been a very complex and a very tedious investigation. Uh, we've been working on it now for some time. There were some recent developments in the case uh, this past uh, few weeks. I don't want to elaborate on those developments, but I will say they are of such magnitude that uh, we must now advise the grand jury uh, that our office uh, will not continue its office investigation, but we feel that we must begin a grand jury investigation.
The Montgomery County Grand Jury is expected to begin hearing evidence in this case the first week in September. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA-TV News at the Montgomery County Courthouse. I have written some songs, pop songs and gospel songs, and I ha have an offer for a new recording contract. And I'll be doing conventions and concerts and appearances like before. Never on the scale so that I don't take away from the quality of life that I found here in Selma and uh, spending that time with my children. They're number one on my priority, but I'm excited about the future. The latest food price survey shows produce leading the way in the sudden cost increase. The cost of produce rose 11.7 percent in August. The cost of pork also went up as well as the price of beef. The price turnaround was not unexpected. Farm Bureau spokesman Paul Till says after five months of steadily dropping prices, the increase was no surprise. Well, one of the things uh, that has caused this is, is, believe it or not, is a drought which we experienced in mid-1983. Always when we have a drought or something severe, there's an immediate impact on uh, the market. But this is more of a scare type tactic. We see an immediate result, but then the real result comes many months later. Not everything is more expensive. The cost of poultry and dairy products actually decreased in August, but not enough to make up for the increases in other areas. For now, beef prices are expected to continue climbing, but overall, experts say this should be a good year for keeping food prices down. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. As Lowndes County Schools opened bright and early this morning, a small group of parents crowded the entrance to Hainville Middle School, bearing picket signs and asking students to stay out of class, while parents seek help from the courts to stop what they call the death of their school. But state education officials, as well as local principals, say the consolidation plan was vital to returning Lowndes County Schools to the road of educational excellence. They'll be able to offer more courses and better courses uh, to students now than they would previously. That's our intent for consolidation. We felt that Lowndes County, small as it is, that just any useless really to have four high schools when by consolidating and having two high schools, it would be we could offer more better course offering rather for the students. Overall, the conversion of schools went smoothly. So smoothly, in fact, State Superintendent of Education, Dr. Wayne Teague, says it was the first time in recent memory students actually looked forward to the first day of school. Although the plan became a reality today, it could very well be thrown out of the window on September 7th. Circuit Judge Arthur Gamble will hold a hearing on whether to grant the parents an injunction to stop the conversion. School board officials say if the injunction is granted, students will return to their former schools until the battle is over. Dr. Johnson believes the consolidation will stand. He says the only way to better educate Lowndes County students is to get them off the picket line and back into the classroom. Dean Argo, WSFA TV News, Lowndes County. As I present my birth certificate, or oh, says we calculate. I had a large family, and so uh, dealing with highways such as in the state, other from an overall viewpoint. The concept of federalism, or if you want to use the word states' rights, has been effective over a number of years. And uh, I think that our system of government, as we have developed it, has been uh, designed to meet the problems of the individual states. We have different problems in California. We have different problems in New Hampshire. And we have different solutions for those problems. And that that is the best way that we ought to follow. Getting to the proposed uh, Uniform Products Liability Act. Area who has achieved academic excellence and who has uh, accomplished a great deal, very qualified, which speaks well of David's being selected in pursuit of your education this year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your <laughs> This is a, a very special award for me. This is important scholarship. Yeah. 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 Yeah.